Hello to our guests. We are having some connection issues, so we ask you to bear with us as we're trying to go live. My name is Doug Wilkes. I'm the executive editor of the uh, Deseret News in Salt Lake City, Utah. With me is uh, His Royal Highness Prince Adnan El Hashemite. Um, Prince Adnan, I welcome you. Thank you. And if we can just wait another minute or two, um, we're trying to have uh, Prisha Sinha, the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Capital Development Fund, join us, as well as uh, Lord Karen Billamoria. He is connecting from the UK, and I know he just texted me. So we are a little delayed, but if you can bear with us, I think this will be a very nice panel. Thank you. So I will pause for just a minute. So we'll wait about 60 seconds and then um, Prince Adnan, if you and I have a conversation, we will do that, but we will, I expect the others to join shortly. We'll just wait one more minute. Thank you. Well, let us at least begin our conversation. Can we do that? So let me introduce uh, His Royal Highness, Prince Adnan. He's a member of the Hashemite Royal House of Iraq and chairman of the Royal Academy of Science International, coming to us from New York today. Um, you've got quite a history. Are you still with the Felician University, uh, Prince Adnan? I'm actually the executive director uh, for the United Nations programs and educational uh, materials on um, diplomacy and international uh, relations as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. So as we talked about our panel, we, we are in a time of stress. So global shock that has come from uh, COVID, now two years into COVID-19, and also from the Ukraine invasion. So all have global ramifications, but we want to kind of see what have we learned, what can be accomplished in the future, um, and we're also interested in the current state of affairs. I know that Sweden and Finland have both uh, requested NATO membership. That has caused some unrest. Turkey is trying to decide what to do with that. So as we begin today, um, Prince Adnan, what are your impressions of what we have learned and um, what we might need to do to go forward? If you could go ahead and take um, as much time as you'd like. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. Uh, at the beginning, I wish to start with uh, thanking and, uh, our esteemed colleagues uh, for this opportunity and extend to everyone. Uh, may peace be upon all as we pray for global peace. Um, following the footsteps of uh, my father, Prince Mohammed, uh, uh, who was a huge educator uh, and with big uh, thumbprints uh, on the world education and uh, the Hashemites teachings, I elected myself uh, to be an educator because education is the key for opening um, any door around the world and at the same time extending to the world um, better understanding and better dialogues and better um, information, accurate information. Um, the world we are living in actually at this moment, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Wilkes, um, it's, it's a world that's unique to me at this moment because for 35 years I've been working in the world of diplomacy, in the world of education, in the world of international relations, and only I find out myself uh, somehow uh, bothered with what's going on uh, for the very basic reason um, that's uh, that keeps on repeating itself over and over again, uh, and that is. Uh, information and the relay of information. Um, it's uh, the facts that are not real accurate uh, anymore. Um, we have opinionated, uh, opinionated decisions uh, that are made not based on actual uh, statements of facts that really taken place around us. Um, 
with the COVID situation, we have witnessed the most important uh, thing uh, that we, the humans, are social beings. And without uh, living our lives as social beings, we are not really going to accomplish any progress. Um, and it, if we witnessed the lack of real accuracy or massive overloads of information that came upon us, uh, whether here in the United States or around the world, the public itself has suffered a lot. And the massive suffering this uh, uh, COVID-19 created, created for us some kind of uh, blockages in our uh, minds, as we call it, that we are no longer able to receive anymore. We have saturation of uh, too much information that some of them are uh, uh, creating the doubt and the theoretical uh, skepticism and uh, uh, that where, where we, whom we can trust with that information is this information is coming to us from real sources who are really backing up their information with data and science and uh, real statistics coming from studies or just it's politicized or opinionated just to serve certain agendas. And that's where we lost the most important element of our life, it's the human factor. The human factor, we cannot underestimate its value anymore. They are not just, the humans uh, are social beings and we cannot actually uh, think of them as uh, uh, herds, uh, people just follow or follow the shepherd. And we have to start really re-engaging that human factor again because without the human factor, we are going to lose a lot. And what, without the human factor, we will not have dialogues and conversations and talks. And as you can see, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, uh, after the COVID, we have the Russian-Ukrainian situation on the field. And then also uh, neutral countries that have sworn to neutrality that they will not really engage in any kind of... Uh, uh, military uh, engagements such as Sweden and uh, Finland uh, are really rethinking their calculation. I mean, it, it tells us something. We are really moving away from the human factor. Uh, what the Greeks have created for us with the Olympic Games was something for us to really sit down and together just engage with dialogue. Let's prove ourselves uh, with our conversation, our abilities uh, and share information and re-dialogue and re-dialogue with the hope we can win a small olive branch wreath on our heads as winners versus winners of weapons and destructions and all of that stuff. So my answer would be, Dr. Wolf, is for us to recognize the human factor. I appreciate that. Let me welcome Prisha Sinha. Hello, it's nice to see you. And also uh, Lord Villamoria from the UK. Can you both hear me okay? Yes, crystal clear, thank you. Thank you, we have introduced our topic. We are um, talking about the human factor. This is the technology factor and it is, it is difficult. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate your attendance. Ms. Sinha, your thoughts about how we move forward coming out of this, these global crises of COVID, the invasion of Ukraine, kind of the restructuring of perhaps NATO with Finland and Sweden, if that happens, uh, unrest from Turkey, certainly, uh, there's certainly issues to be dealt with. What is your perspective about how we move forward? So thanks, Doug. Uh, let me start by saying I have the privilege of being in uh, the chambers of Lord Billimoria. I'm here opposite the House of Lords, uh, so that's why you see this setting. But to address this very serious um, question that you posed, you know I represent the United Nations here, so I would reflect back to the UN Charter that was formed in such difficult times at a period before, right? It was perhaps a different dimension, but difficult times nonetheless. And therefore, the UN Charter says international cooperation is needed to solve social, economic, cultural, and humanitarian problems. So here, let me dwell uh, on the kinds of cooperations we've been doing in the past few days, actually. So one is cooperation with our UN partners. So as the UN exists uh, to serve, uh, we are partnering with the WFP, the World Food Programme, to see how we can play our role. And as you may know, 
I represent the UN Capital Development Fund, which is a financing entity within the UN. So how do we complement WFP's uh, great crisis response uh, ability and facilities with uh, investment into the food securities issue? Uh, so, for example, local production for local consumption, uh, strengthen the um, the infrastructure for food, uh, build you know storage and etc., and then help enterprises so that the local people, perhaps not wheat, if not wheat, could eat uh, the local foods such as tapioca, cassava. So that's a partnership uh, with UN agencies. We have another one on with UN Habitat signed two weeks ago, where we'll invest in cities. Uh, another one is uh, partnerships with uh, global capital commercial and uh, donor capital. So I'm just coming from a signing of both a build fund for SMEs and a Meridium uh, IMF you know, fund for municipalities. So how can we pull global capital, global, global private capital into these current situations? And then uh, lastly is the partnership with the countries themselves. So as you know, we serve the least of the developed countries and our partnership with countries like Malawi, etc., to build uh, pipelines. So that's our work that's continuing in these difficult times. But you know, our experience in uh, the digital field, the local infrastructure and the SME investments, I believe are all three uh, instruments we could take uh, two difficult crisis situations where we could uh, perhaps, um, you know, we think about conflict in three stages, pre-conflict, prevention of conflict, preparedness, then during conflict and post-conflict. So we feel these three tools are very useful in all those stages and hopefully more in the first that we could prevent conflict. Um, so we're very much starting to work on peace, uh, how to take in a bit financing into the peace situations. And I'm can, happy to come to that uh, some further. And, uh, you know, looking at the moment is the how do you work um, in regions that need assistance in crisis settings and the food security issue? Those are the two. And I would say we are tackling it with global cooperation, which is very much the title of today's topic. Excellent. We'll be able to go through that. Let me also join. We're joined by Lord Karen uh, Billamoria. Lord, thank you for joining us. He is the founder of Cobra Beer and the chairman of Cobra Beer Partnership. Um, and pertinent certainly to this conversation, he's the founding chairman of the UK India Business Council. Um, and each of our distinguished guests has a long resume, and I encourage you to go and see their expertise as we go through. But Lord Billamoria, your thoughts on our topic today? about how we come through these crises and how we build bridges globally. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me and see me clearly? Yes? Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry about the technical hitches in joining you, but here we are. Um, I uh, am, am uh, Chancellor of the University of Birmingham, one of our larger Russell Group universities in, in the UK, one of the top 100 in the world. Um, and I've been an independent crossbench peer in the House of Lords, the upper house in the UK, for 16 years now. And another role that I hold at the moment is for the last two years, I've been president of the Confederation of British Industry, which is the largest and preeminent business organization in, in the UK. Uh, we, we, we speak for 190,000 businesses, one third of the private sector workforce in the UK across all sectors, including the large FTSE 100, FTSE 250 companies, and the 200 of the largest trade associations, including the National Farmers Union, for example, uh, and Innovate UK. Um, so I've seen this uh, crisis uh, as President CBI, starting with completing Brexit um, and then the pandemic that came out of nowhere and now the sad uh, Ukraine war. So it's been one crisis after another. And really, it's been a lesson of leading in crises. Um, and I just go back, if I may, to set the scene to 2017 January. And I was attending a refresher class at the Harvard Business School. And Professor Ravi Abdullah put up a graph of globalization. And remember, 2000, January 2017 was what had happened in 2016. We'd had the Brexit vote, which uh, was uh, not accepted, 52, 48% to leave the European Union from the UK. And we had the Trump victory uh, coming into the, in the US presidential elections in the November. And the, the globalization graph basically went back to 1815 after the Battle of Waterloo and showed the rise of globalization all the way up to just before the First World War. Then the First World War, which was not really expected. And after, of course, globalization plummeted. It picked up again. Second World War caused by the First World War. Globalization plummets again. And then the graph starts in 1945 after the Second World War. And today it has surpassed the peak just before the First World War. So if history repeats itself, what happens in conflict? And what have we got in the world today but conflict? So this is a very dangerous situation we have if we learn from history. 
And in my presidency, I've seen the sad pandemic in India last year in April and May. If you remember the horrible scenes uh, of people uh, tragically dying because of a lack of oxygen, uh, we rallied round, worked with the Indian High Commissioner, provided help to India over here. The British industry is a force for good um, with ventilators, uh, with generators, with oxygen cylinders. And then you fast forward, the Indian High Commissioner said the country that helped the most India at that time was the British Indian High Commission in, the, in London. And when the Ukraine crisis started on the 24th of February, when the war started, I reached out to the Ukrainian ambassador. And now for the past, since then, um, end of February, March, April, for coming up to three months, we've been working on a daily basis with the Ukraine ambassador, Vadim Prastaiko, here in the UK, helping on a humanitarian basis. So not only do we have sanctions, not only do we have British businesses, many businesses stopping doing business with Russia, but on a humanitarian basis, where there's ration packs, millions of them, where there's food packages to prevent starvation, we've been working. And the Edelman Barometer 2022 now has business as the most trusted institution. Uh, so I will, I will leave it there, but I'm very proud of the role business has played in these time of crises. And I've given you two examples of helping India in a time of crisis and now helping Ukraine in a time of crisis. Thank you, thank you all. Prince Adnan, this, this issue of trust, we need the human component, but our institutions, whether it's government or other institutions, um, have seen a lack of trust. I'm in the media, certainly media has a lack of trust. So how do you overcome those trust issues to move forward? Um, in reality, no. Um, the, the actual uh, situation of mistrust, uh, whether it's in the media or policymakers, or, uh, has grown bigger uh, due to the fact that uh, those institutions or public institutions have allowed the, uh, uh, the private sector or the, uh, the normal people or the social uh, system to over-investigate uh, without basis. What it means, like everybody started looking and making their own theories versus uh, because of the lack or, or, or the emptiness that the, the policymakers and the media has provided. They provided an emptiness that was just filled with overload of information that really did not support or help anybody. And in other words, like for example, we had two sides of the coin. Many professors, many teachers, many uh, scientists, many doctors themselves were actually investigating the COVID situation versus, uh, and they are credible people. They have publications, they have all kinds of backgrounds that are really uh, well known around the world. And they are licensed people. I mean, it's not fathomable uh, if they will, they will be willing to lose their own uh, licenses just for the sake of becoming uh, uh, conspiracy theorists. Uh, and the, the other side of the media or the policymakers are just trying to force as much as information without explanation. And the mistrust has risen too high to a level that anybody says anything nowadays, uh, just automatically it's been labeled, uh, you are uh, like some kind of, uh, of a special agenda. And that's where it stands at this moment. Okay, thank you. Lord Billamoria, you just most recently announced a, a UK-India task force trying to get trade um, for business between India and the UK. Can you talk about broaching that and what the hope is for that kind of an agreement? Yes, and if I just may touch on this whole aspect of trust. Um, yes. Francis Fry, a, a professor who taught me at Harvard Business School, during the pandemic gave a, a virtual lecture on trust. And to summarize it, she described trust as a triangle. To engender trust, you have to A, be authentic. B, you have to have the logic. You have to have the professional capability to deliver what you say you're going to be doing. And C, the third point of the triangle, is empathy. Are you in it for yourself? Are you in it for them? So authenticity, logic, and empathy, that's how you can engender trust and get people to trust you. And if you look at any situation now, look at the situation with Russia. Is there trust there? at all if you try any one of those tests of those of the triangle. Uh, so that, I think that works everywhere. With the UK-India Industry Task Force, um, we have in the UK now, since leaving the European Union, 
we've not only rolled over 66 bilateral trade deals that the European Union had with other countries such as Japan and Canada, uh, we have also now started signing new free trade deals. We did one with Australia in a month, record record one-year negotiations, New Zealand, and now we're in the midst of the India free trade agreement. Uh, this industry task force between the UK and India is going to be helping with bilateral trade and investment in the free trade agreement. The target is to complete this agreement by October, and we have huge hopes uh, to reduce tariffs, to reduce the barriers of doing business, which will be to the benefit of both countries' economies. And of course, there's the movement of people as well. Uh, we have the largest uh, ethnic minority diaspora in the UK is the Indian community, the one and a half million of Indians, people of Indian origin like me, uh, who are living bridge between uh, the UK and India. And the more mobility we can have, particularly of young people, that will be a benefit uh, to both countries. And of course, it's also university to university links and research links. Uh, it covers the whole spectrum. Thank you so much. Ms. Sinha, you're, you're dealing with money and trying to drive change. Can you speak to the issue of trust, but also how you can bring some of these transformations uh, through the work you're doing and with UN cooperation? Doug, thanks. Um, I think I'd use the word trust um, related to bridges. So there have to be lots of bridges between public capital and private capital. So there is this trust building. I call it bridge building uh, in some respects. And, you know, I'm just coming from a Moral Money Summit here, lots of private capital there, big pension funds. How do we connect big institutional capital to the aspects of development? So the idea would be uh, some of us in this uh, role, uh, perhaps speaking the languages of both sides of that uh, debate, can try to bridge those, um, those bridges, that trust, uh, trust uh, mountain that somehow needs to be um, climbed. And uh, we are doing that. I mean, the funds that I mentioned, let me maybe just speak on them a little bit. The BUILD Fund is a SME fund uh, investing in the least developed countries into the um, ent entrepreneurs. So can we get mainstream private capital into that fund? It's got 20% uh, first loss cover by the public capital. Uh, the same, the Meridium uh, IMF Municipal Fund into the infrastructure. So as you know, infrastructure, I mean, I was just reading something uh, on the African report that infrastructure is very essential in order to create the SDG achievement. So I think that aspect of creating a dialogue, so we're starting with dialogue. We're bringing countries, for example, we've got Ethiopia and we've got Rwanda in the past on a, on a call with institutional capital in New York. Um, and now I'm going, our team of, is going down to Malawi to create a pipeline of bankable projects. So we're trying to help, you know, build capacity at the country level. It's something, uh, you know, we'll continue to do. And that's how we think that some of those bridges can be built by really, we are a development partner. We are there for the journey, the journey, hopefully, uh, you know, in peace times towards development, but through difficult times as well. Uh, Miss Inia, if I can stay with you for just one minute, you've spoken about the need for digital transformation and particularly in the world's 46 least developed countries. I was looking at some of the work you've been doing. Are there are there barriers to doing that, or is technology the is technology the key bridge, or is it money, or how do you, in this current time in 2022, what is how do you what is the bridge you're trying to establish? Certainly, Doug. So the main bridge we are building is of capital, capital into these countries. You know more than the kind of aid capital that goes in. So to throw some numbers out. The total ODA, you know, measured by OECD is $178 billion across, let's say, the funding of the World Bank, funding of uh, all the other entities. And then uh, the private capital that sits, it's uh, $400 trillion, right? So what is the mission of capital? Shouldn't capital serve humanity? Did we not uh, make this uh, a social construct ourselves? And now we need it to come back uh, to our aid to, in, you know, ensure better, better lives. So certainly our main mission is on technology, on finance, but we think technology is a great enabler. It helps us really jump some of those infrastructure steps, uh, some of the development steps. So what we need on the digital is to help countries uh, develop ICT policies. Uh, they need to you know, have a ministry that looks at ICT, look at connectivity. So we have something called the scorecard, the um, in inclusive digital economy scorecard that measures Connectivity. We've done that in Solomon Islands, in Burkina Faso, and across the world. 
So I think certainly the technology accompanies uh, finance. So for example, my challenge right here to a call to action would be the Sahel issue, right? Sahel, a great drought stricken area. There was a woman with 600 cattle and now she's only 35 left. So what aspect of technology can help uh, address, you know, this impact of climate, unfortunately? So is there some technology, uh, some degree of an irrigation, uh, drought resistant plantation, something that uh, can help uh, then accompany um, finance? Because finance can't uh, solve that impact uh, without technology. Mm -hmm. Lord Billamoria, part of your agreement deals with, with green energy and trying to uh, cut down the barriers to do that. Can you speak a little bit, uh, playing off of what um, uh, Ms. Sinha has also spoken of? Yes, I, I had the privilege at uh, COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow in November. Uh, I attended one and a half out of the two weeks there. And what was really different about this COP compared with previous ones is in the past, you've always had governments and NGOs present, making commitments um, and being there on force. This time, what was different is we had business present in a big way. So not only was it governments making commitments, uh, including India, for example, making a commitment uh, to net zero by a certain date, uh, you also had businesses making commitments. And to give you an example, 60% of the FTSE 100 companies in the UK have now committed to net zero by 2050. Uh, companies in the midst of the pandemic last year were EY, for example, uh, committed to going carbon negative in 2021, at the beginning of 2021, and they achieved it by October. So it was wonderful to see that. What also was exhibited was the power of not only finance. We now have the GFANS. We have $130 trillion worth of asset-backed finance that will be available for green finance. We have the UK, for example, now becoming a world headquarters of green finance. There is a green industrial revolution. The next point that's come up is it's a transition. This is not an on-off switch where we're going to switch from fossil fuels now to green renewable energy straight away. There is a transition. And the final point I want to make, I could talk hours about this topic, uh, but the final point I want to make is innovation. It is so important with technology. And if I give you a quick example, the University of Birmingham, uh, we have one of the world's leading railway institutes as part of our Department of Engineering. Ten years ago, 2012, a research project, a student research project to develop a hydrogen-powered train. It became a hydrogen-powered model inside our department called Hydrogen Hero. And the next thing, it became a fully-fledged, the world's first retrofitted hydrogen-powered train called Hydroflex, which was up and running in Glasgow. Prince Charles was on the train. Prime Minister Boris Johnson was on the train. And I chaired a meeting of university of transport leaders from around the world on this train. And it's an example of university research, companies such as Siemens and Porterbrook, the rolling stock company, and government, government finance, working together to create world-beating innovation. Uh, so it's very powerful. And if you do it, particularly on a cross-border basis, it's amazing. Thank you. Prince Adnan, as you look across the world, is there what is the problem that you think... Uh, uh, working together can solve? In other words, as you look at something that is very important to you, uh, you're coming at it from a scientific point of view, you talk about human connection, but what would you say? Is it is it green energy, climate? Is it world hunger? What What's top of mind for you? It's actually um, what we have witnessed over the past 15 years with our research at the Royal Academy of Science and dealing on ground in the field with the people themselves. What we have witnessed that uh, the interdependency or inter-nation uh, dependency on programs that are cross borders, that are crossing borders, have actually eliminated the ability for the small enterprise to grow and to really develop themselves. Uh, I think we really need to revisit our uh, policies uh, on finance uh, for small operations. And we, we should really encourage more for the $1 million to $5 million um, uh, investments in these operations because they are the key factors. They are the ones who really move fast versus if it were a big corporation and uh, government or uh, something like that. As I always uh, educate my students on uh, the fact of uh, if you are small, you are like a motorbike. 
and you can maneuver and move very fast as at, to the speed that you wish and you can accomplish more versus if you are a government or or big corporation you are in a comparison of a tank or a big uh, trailer i mean that actually takes forever and ever to move from one spot to another spot so which one is better so i think we should revisit our policies on uh financing and reinvesting in small operations uh and i'm not talking about the small small ones i'm talking about the one million to five million dollars operations that are the key and the backbone of every economy thank you Ms. Sinha, what are the what are the problems we should be solving? One of our topics today was we, there was great global cooperation, although you know measured in some areas as it relates to fighting COVID. It wasn't perfect, but we learned a lot. What are the problems you think we can address through cooperation? So, Doug, I've always held that we need to focus on the basic standards of living for all. You know, I believe uh, as humans, as an intelligent uh, species race, that uh, we must enable uh, everything we have for all. So really, we can't, uh, you know, be in one country and see starvation in another country. So the the, the six uh, kind of pillars, which are some of the SDGs here, would for me would be food, water, shelter. That is essential for human life, followed by health, education and jobs. Right. So this kind of selection of these six criteria, which is a simple uh, question, is what do humans need to live? Right. So the first three are the first two are essential food and water, shelter as well. And then the others to create that kind of basic standard of living. So I think what you said about, for example, health, let's take health. I mean, you know, we can't have countries with no primary health care system, no national you know, health. I mean, the world as one has to try to accomplish this. So entrepreneurial mind, I'm a big believer in social entrepreneurs, a uh, big believer in, uh, you know, finding that capital that wants to do good and then kind of creating a sustainable business model. I mean, the grants are very welcome to kickstart, uh, you know, projects and programs, but can we challenge her? And I believe, I believe in the human spirit. I believe in the aspirations across the world that there are entrepreneurs out there in every country that want to create these systems. We just have to enable them, enable them perhaps uh, with the aid, but then uh, with the capital so that, you know, in every part of the world, we have these basic standards of living and we don't see these horrific uh, images of uh, the human race being subjected to these. So I think global cooperation to create basic standards of living for all. Thank you. Lord Billamoria, what would you say to that? in terms of the problems that can be solved or what should be solved? Yes, I think that um, I'm going to be giving a, a lecture before I finish my CBI presidency on the lessons I've learned uh, in these two years. And basically, it's leading through crises. How do you lead through crises? And I've seen with the COVID pandemic, and I, that one of the best examples is with the vaccination. Um, we in, 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 in Britain, we the Prime Minister appointed Dame Kate Bingham and said, now just go and find back vaccines and let's finance, help finance them. And we had the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which was the one, the main one developed in the UK. And that's Oxford University developing the vaccine, teaming up with AstraZeneca, a British Swedish company headquartered in Cambridge, and then in turn teaming up with the Serum Institute of India, the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world before the pandemic, owned by the Punawas. Now, uh, Preeti is, is, is half Zoroastrian Parsi. I'm a Zoroastrian Parsi, one of the tiniest communities in the world. There are just 100,000 of us. And uh, I'm and the Punawalas are Zoroastrian Parsis in, based in Pune in India. And they have now produced 2 billion doses of this Astra, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, saving millions and millions of lives. So that is the power uh, of universities, business, working on a cross-border basis uh, to the benefit of humanity. If we look at, uh, for example, what's happening now in the Ukraine, uh, the latest problem, which I discovered from the ambassador here, Vadim Prostaiko, yesterday we had our CBI annual dinner in which he spoke very movingly, the food security. Ukraine, the breadbasket of the world, 50% plus of sunflower oil comes from Ukraine. Wheat, a huge proportion comes from Ukraine for the whole world. They cannot export their wheat because their ports are blocked. Odessa is blocked by the Russians. There are 70 ships that are stuck over there. And now how do we, to get all the wheat and, and grain that is there in Ukraine out by road and rail would take, without exaggeration, five years. And the next harvest this summer, there will be nowhere. The no silos are full because you can't get the grain out. So we need to unblock that port. We need as a global community to come together because the repercussions otherwise 
are going to be dire. I don't want to be a doom monger, but it could lead to famine across the world for hundreds of millions of people. We cannot let that happen. We cannot watch, uh, as the head of the UN Food Programme said, a silent tsunami in front of our, below our noses, in front of our eyes. We've got to stop it before it happens as a global community and come together. And the way it came together during the financial crisis, I remember Prime Minister Gordon Brown leading the way to get the global community to come together in the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. So is there a, if I ask you, okay, what's the first step for that cooperation, what would you say? The first step would be all the countries, literally the whole of the world, uniting every country in the United Nations. And this is where you cannot have a veto of the Security Council that blocks this. And this is where Britain as a country can take leadership and everyone in the interest preventing starvation, preventing famine, preventing deaths in a humanitarian, compassionate basis, reach out to Russia and say, you must allow a corridor to come through. You've got to remove those mines. You've got to stop your warships from stopping ships coming in and out of Odessa for the sake of humanity worldwide. And this is where we've got to stand together. The whole world has got to stand together. And the UN can help to lead the way there as well. Um, and, and I'm sure it's possible. Ms. Sinha, you have, the, you have a UN sensibility. Would you agree with that? I totally agree with that. Uh, I really believe uh, the UN, we are fortunate, well, have a great responsibility to be the cradle of these 193 country member states. And um, it, it just got to be one voice, one voice, uh, you know, we all recognize what the issue is. Uh, you know, first of all, in my view, there should be a no war slogan, right? And that's what the Secretary General said when he visited uh, Ukraine, how is it possible in 2021 that we have war? I mean, of that horrific nature. So um, I think we need to prevent it. Uh, I think we could take the General Assembly vote uh, that voted, uh, you know, in um, 141 in favor of all, uh, stopping all of this. So I think, uh, but on the humanitarian side, uh, you know, just the simple uh, economics and the welfare of the food that's, you know, 25 million tons waiting in the port while people are getting distress all over the world. I think um, the humanitarian forces need to go in, if nothing else. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear, we're drawing near the end of our session, but Prince Adnan, uh, I'll give each of you a final say if we can begin with you. What do you take away from this conversation about what we need to do in terms of drawing together as a world to solve the world's problems? That's a pretty big question, but what, what, what's your final word? My final words would be actually, um, I respectfully agree semi or somehow with uh, my colleagues uh, uh, and with all due respect to them, uh, we should really uh, start reinvesting in diversifying uh, our resources, not just because of wars. I mean, uh, in the, the Ukraine-Russian situation, uh, we learned that uh, major interdependency on one nation or two nations can really create uh, the major headache that we have and future famines. However, if we diversify our resources and invest in these resources, uh, which are capable of producing the very same thing that Ukraine is producing, um, that will be the solution for our nations, for our world, a better world and better employment everywhere and better solutions for everyone. Thank you. Ms. Sinha, your final thoughts about what we should do looking forward? Surely. Well, I will say my focus will be on capital markets for development. I uh, have uh, the strongest determination of making sure that public and private capital work together just because they have to to achieve any of the things that we talked about here. It cannot be one side or the other. So I'll be focused on that. Uh, I see Mahesh Kotecha wanted the floor, but I there's time to have him in. But that's going to be my complete focus. Thanks. OK. And the final words from Lord Bill Moria. How can thank you, you send us welcome to the world? Yes, thank you so much. This has been a tremendous session. And I would say this, that um, this has been a wake-up call for the world. I think the UN has to be reformed. That there's a, It's a wonderful organization, but it needs reform, and this has shown it more than ever. NATO has shown as a defensive alliance how important NATO is. Finland and Sweden have now applied to join NATO. And I think defense and trade and security go hand in hand. Uh, somebody said, uh, saying that freedom, unfortunately, is not free. And I'm very proud of the United Kingdom. It has wonderful soft power, but soft power on its own also needs hard power. And it's that combination of hard power and soft power that is very important. And most importantly, working together, collaborating cross-border 
and, and with, a, with a complete objective of peace. We cannot be in this session again, in, in this situation again. Thank you so much uh, to our esteemed panel. Um, fascinating. And I think you're right. We could talk about any number of these topics, particularly interested in how we feed the world, right? That's what we've been trying to do since the world began. Um, to those our guests, uh, please reach out to our panelists. Um, either follow them through this conference or uh, individually. Um, and on behalf of the Deseret News, um, here in the state of Utah in the United States, uh, the Deseret News is trying to be a convener of global solutions, and we're very grateful for uh, being a part of, uh, of this uh, plenary to run the world, um, and for Frank and others who have invited us. So with that, we will let you go wherever you are, and um, thanks so much to my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. you. A pleasure.